Good evening and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we've got a great show for you, including answering all your gardening questions. Tonight is a tape program though, so we cannot take your phone calls. You can still submit those emails and pictures for a future show to byf at unl.edu. We do need to know where you live, please, and give us as much information as you can so we can give you a good answer. We'd also like to encourage you to follow us on Facebook, check out our video features on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. So we'll start with some samples. Kyle, that does not look like an acorn on an oak. It's, it's not. Um, so this is kind of just an interesting curiosity, I think. Um, this particular sample is a gall caused by a cynipid gall wasp. Um, and these are commonly called oak apple galls. So I, I suppose somebody thought that it kind of looked like an apple. Um, but so here's, here's kind of the, the gall, what it would look like on the leaf. They form those on the leaf. And then here's one I, I cut open earlier, if, we can, if I can hold it here. So it's a little bit uh, kind of not in the greatest shape now, but just in that very center, uh, there's kind of this almost like a seed. Um, and that's where the, the larva develops inside. <clears throat> and so these gull wasps really have very interesting biology. So they, they're basically able to manipulate the plant into producing this gall that, that grows around it. They produce these chemicals and they affect undifferentiated cells in the plant as those leaves are, are developing. And um, they do that by, you know, they, they manipulate it by turning genes on and off at specific times in development. And um, so just have this really cool biology. So then not only does it produce this gall that protects the, uh, the insect inside, but it also actually then, um, in that kind of seed-like portion there, it's basically providing this nutritive tissue that the, the larva is constantly feeding from. And as it feeds from it, the plant just produces more and replaces it. So it's just constantly being fed um, and supported by, by the plant. So like most gall insects, these really don't cause any harm um, to the tree. They're really just more kind of a, a curiosity. It's not anything to be concerned about. Sometimes they can look really concerning um, when, you, when we see those on our trees, but uh, nothing to be, be too alarmed about, just kind of something interesting to appreciate when you see those uh, out in your, your landscape. They look like green bubble gum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rock, you brought the evil weed again yeah, and, on and purpose. On purpose. So <laughs> this is a field blind weed, and I think most people know that from the heart-shaped leaf and the white trumpet flowers. And this one's pretty wilted. That's on me because I pulled it a little bit earlier. But the amazing thing about this plant in particular and about a couple hundred of its friends is it's underneath a rain-out shelter at our research site, which means we have a rain-out shelter that we pull off the plots. But that project quit about four years ago. So this site has not seen rain for four years. And then we've had a couple of droughty years, right? So you think about, it's not Tenacious D, the Jack Black group, it's just tenacious. And plus it produces such copious amounts of seeds and they can stay dormant in the soil for up to 30 years. So this one's producing seed, we're gonna have to get up underneath there and get it cleaned up so it doesn't spread in the wind and everything else. But the bottom line is, is there used to be no real good control for it, selective control, um, but there is, um, a quinclorac or, or drive is a really good product for that particular this particular weed. People spray it with Roundup all the time, don't have much results. But there is a herbicide control. You can pull it. You want to pull it before this seed sets um, so that you're not spreading further seed. But be sure you get every piece of it. All right. Thank you, Rock. Amy, that's uh, not a real pretty one either. No, it's not pretty. <laughs> so Kyle was nice enough and gave this sample. It came in from the clinic. And here's the trick. It's a juniper sample. And if we take a really close look at the stems, um, and the branches, you're seeing all this orange stuff on there. And this is cedar quince rust. You hear us talk about cedar apple rust, but this is cedar quince on juniper. And this one's unique because it forms these galls just like cedar apple on the branches of the juniper species, but this does not form those big galls and those mummy heads and gelatinous orange tentacles coming out. This stays very close to the branches and it's still exuding all those spores that are now flying to our quince and our apple and all those species to actually cause that foliar disease. Now, the interesting thing about this sample is this is a sample from Lincoln. However, these are new junipers that were shipped in. And so this is one thing for you guys to take a look at when you're buying new 
trees and new plant material for your yards or for your gardens, make sure you take a look and make sure everything looks healthy so you don't take something home with you by mistake. Um, this is one of those samples. It, cedar quince is very common. It isn't quarantinable. And so it just made it through the system. But as a homeowner, I wouldn't necessarily want to buy this and then bring it to my, op or to my home knowing that eh, I'm not going to like the looks of it. So make sure you're looking at those new plants before you take them home and put them in the ground. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. All right. What is that exactly, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, I brought something that can maybe help avoid some problems in the garden. So this is a row cover fabric. Uh, you might have seen this. Most people associate it with like fall and winter where we're going to protect crops from fall, uh, from frost. Uh, but you can actually use it in spring and summer uh, as integrated pest management to keep some insects away. Uh, so you can use it as a floating row cover. It can float right over the plants and then you, um, take the edges and put rocks or even soil over it to seal the plants in. And that keeps certain insect pests away from your crops. Uh, it's very helpful for things like um, leafy greens or broccoli, cauliflower, uh, things that don't need a pollinator. Uh, you can just keep them covered throughout the growing and it can keep all those little, uh, like the, the cabbage looper caterpillars, etc., cetera, off. Uh, you can use it on uh, things like cucumber and squash to keep squash bugs and cucumber beetles off. Uh, and then the problem is that they need bees to pollinate them. So you have to take it off when the flowers form, but that gives you a little more time before those insects get on there and cause damage or give them uh, diseases, which we have in some cases, like with uh, the, the wilt on cucumbers and things like that. So that can buy you a little time, even if you have to take it off. Excellent, thank you, John. All right, first round of pictures is yours, Kyle. Oh gosh, what is this growing on my cedar trees and how do I take care of them? I live in central Nebraska. Okay, <laughs> um, those are evergreen bagworms and um, <clears throat> they're, they're a, a familiar foe. So they, you know, they're really here in Lincoln, eastern Nebraska, very southeastern Nebraska, they would be emerging um, any time now. So, you know, it's really time to start thinking about, about control for those. Now, central Nebraska, you have maybe another, another week or two before those are for, forecasted to start emerging. So, um, you know, in central Nebraska, you might still be able to pull off um, those, those bags before uh, the eggs hatch and the larvae start emerging. Otherwise, once the larvae have emerged, they can be um, treated up until the, they, they reach about half of an inch in size. And so there's a number of different treatment options available. BT is really good, especially on young caterpillars. Um, you can use um, an insecticidal soap or um, there's also a number of, of synthetic insecticides that are maybe better for, for if those caterpillars are getting a little bit larger. All right, you have uh, one picture here and then one following that. And I think we've had at least last week all sorts of these all over uh, at least eastern Nebraska. What are these? Are they still around? They are still around. Yep, they're um, ash sawflies, brown-headed ash sawfly, and they are extremely abundant, at least here in, in Lincoln this year. I, I think maybe it's because of the, the lack of, of real heavy rain that, you know, it, they're, they're really susceptible to getting dislodged from the tree, and so um, that's one thing we can use to our advantage is, you know, if you can you're seeing those in, in your landscape around your ash. You, if you can give it a real forceful um, sort of spray with um, water, that can dislodge a lot of those uh, larvae and they won't be able to get back up. That can control uh, quite a few of them. Otherwise, there's not really a lot of practical insecticidal options for them. All right, and you have two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is a carny viewer. Asparagus in a few different locations. Um, stalks have started to curl and then the primary, I, they're, they're actually branching. It's pretty interesting. Doesn't notice any insects, but what are we thinking here? Well, I'd, in the first image, I definitely see some eggs there for, um, for the asparagus beetle. So um, for sure that there's, there's a, at least a little bit of an issue there with that. And asparagus beetle feeding, they will um, cause the, the stalks to kind of curl and, and bend like that. So um, I, I suspect, well, certainly that's an issue that, that should be monitored. So um, you can you know, remove any heavily infested 
um, branches. Um, also, you know, you can just kind of go in and hand pick in relatively small plantings, hand pick beetles if you identify them, um, especially up around the tops. They, they like to concentrate um, and then remove those eggs as you're seeing them. Um, usually that's, that's you know, sufficient in a small planting. Um, there might be something else going on if it's happened continuously over several years, but I, I would try just, you know, seeing if you can monitor for those beetles and, and keep those in control. All right, thanks, Kyle. Rock, this is a really interesting one, these two pictures. This viewer actually had a soil test done and is uh, wondering actually uh, about the pH, which is close to normal. He's wondering about adding lime to increase the pH, sulfur to get into the optimal range. He knows he doesn't need to do anything or knows what to do to increase nitrogen and iron. So what are we thinking here? Well, good for him for, um, I believe it was him, for, for taking the time to send in a sample and having it analyzed and everything. A couple of things here, that pH is what we would expect in um, eastern Nebraska. We tend to be a, slightly on the acidic side, and then as we move west and get into lower rainfall, we start going to the more basic side. Um, so that pH is not anything to be concerned about. It's not in the zone where we would see nutrient deficiencies. It's If you can be between 6 and 7.5, 7, 5, 7 6, you're fine to go. So I wouldn't mess with trying to alter the pH. Plus, our soils in eastern Nebraska don't. Um, that you can change the pH relatively quickly for about two hours, right? It, you know, I mean, it literally <laughs> reverts back. It has this great buffering capacity. Um, and then sulfur is a transient element. So if they did that test the next day, it may or may not be low. And we rarely see, unless the plants are showing yellowing, um, which would be a sulfur deficiency, I wouldn't worry about it. So I wouldn't modify the soil. Everything else looked in line, and I would be pleased with a soil that was that healthy. All right, thank you. Uh, two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is a what is this and how does she get rid of it? It's on the east facing side of a house and is spreading. This is an Omaha viewer. Well, Kim, as you and I discussed, we, you know, we bounced a couple ideas around. It looks very much like yellow nut sedge, only a little more robust than it should be this time of year. And after looking at closer and seeing some rhizome growth on the surface, I believe this to be an ornamental carex that's kind of gotten away from them. Um, and, you know, any of the uh, um, sedge herbicides, you know, like, like um, sedge hammer and others, would probably do a pretty good job on that. But it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty well established. So it's not gonna just happen overnight. And you can, you can pull the carex, but it's got an extensive root and rhizome system on it. So you're gonna be pulling up for a long. So I would try, the, uh, try to clear as much as you can with, by manually. And then if you don't see much res results with that, consider going to uh, one of the sedge herbicides and um, spraying it a couple of times within three weeks of each other in the next uh, month or so. All right, thank you, Rock. Amy, two mm -hmm. pictures on this one, on your first one. This is a uh, Blair, Nebraska viewer, two 25-year-old honey locust trees. They have these off-white markings in the bark. They're wondering if it's a disease or a critter, and if it is a disease, what? And if it's a critter, would disease follow the critter mm -hmm. chew? <laughs> so this is actually really a dentist question. It's a critter. This is actually squirrel damage. Um, with the winter and how dry it was, the squirrels were actually after water. And so they've done this girdling of the branches. Now on the disease standpoint where I like to talk, it is an opening. It is providing an opportunity for fungi and bacteria to come in there and we can have canker development. Like on this picture, it's a branch. Um, you could easily prune that out, but the one previous looked like more, it was on the trunk. And with that, we're not gonna be able to prune it out. So. You're just going to need to watch it and monitor it. Do not paint it. Do not add anything because all you're going to do is trap the moisture inside and allow those pathogens to move in. So at this point in time, leave it alone. It is those squirrels. Maybe next year, I don't know, put some water out for the squirrels so they don't have to chew on your trees. I don't know if that works or not. I have to ask Dennis sometime. <laughs> Depends on the squirrel. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is also a Blair viewer. Uh, this is a silver maple. And we, I, the pictures on this show the, the maple itself. And then we have maybe even a third picture on this one, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And oh my goodness. Yeah. There's a lot going on yeah. here. Um, so with this picture, in all reality, if you take a look at it, you got that wet spot that kind of looks like a nose. You can add eyes and the big tongue hanging out so you can have a big scary maple tree. Um, but what this really is, is we have weeping occurring and you see where that beard or that tongue would be coming out of that face. This is 
this isn't a disease. To me, it looks like that the tree was damaged at some point in time. And this is the tree trying to close off that damage. And so it's done a lot of woody growth. Um, the one thing with this tree, with how large that is and how low that damage is, I will start being concerned about looking at the upper part of the tree, looking for making sure the tree staying dense and not getting thin. If it's starting to get thin, then I'm gonna start wondering about integrity of the tree as a whole. Um, most likely with that weeping, maples do weep naturally, but sometimes when we have that much in injury in there, we're also gonna get wet rots on the inside of that heartwood, and so that's going to affect the integrity. So one thing that you can do, yes, it's gonna cause a wound, is you can take a long drill bit and drill into the trunk, and if it's solid, you're gonna hear it going the entire way. Um, if we're getting a, it, a heart rot and it's hollowing out, all of a sudden that drill bit's gonna go zoop, right through, just think about going through like sheetrock and you miss the stud, it just goes zip right in. Exact same thing will happen there and that will give you an idea. And if it's gonna zip right in, depending on where that tree is at, you may wanna consider removing it because when we get those strong winds with our uh, winter, or not our winter, sorry, summer storm series, that tree will be at a higher risk of falling. And if it's gonna potentially fall in your home or on other personal property, you're better off taking it out early. All right, thanks, Amy. All right, uh, two pictures on this first one, John. Uh, this is a viewer who has a uh, string of hearts, house plant. She thinks these are little seed pods. They're fleshy inside, even if the outside looks dry. Right, so you're almost right. So these are interesting, they're aerial tubers. Uh, so they are a reproductive, reproductive structure, but they come from uh, the stems. They arise after that little string of hearts has bloomed, uh, and then those little tubers form. So you can actually uh, pop those off and stick them in soil, and they will grow into new plants. Uh, or you can do cuttings and then stick those in, and they, they root very easily. All right, uh, one picture on this next one. This is a Raymond viewer. Planted a bag of tulips last fall and this came up. She wonders, is this a weird tulip or something else? <laughs> well, it uh, definitely isn't a tulip. It is an allium. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which species of allium it is, but uh, it's interesting because there, an allium is basically an onion. This is an ornamental onion. Uh, and we have all different kinds with all different kinds of big poofy heads on the top. Uh, and so that's an allium. You can enjoy it. There are native, sort of native ones. There are not native ones, uh, but they do, are attractive flowers, and hopefully you, you'll be able to uh, sort of separate that out in years to come and have more of them than just one. They're, they're much prettier when there's more than one of them. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, enjoy your allium. Great. Thanks, John. Well, you know, it might seem strange to talk about grasshopper control when we haven't even seen them yet, but Wayne is here to tell you that right now is the perfect time to scout for grasshoppers and start a few of those control measures. So for grasshoppers, we have a number of contributing factors as to whether they're in high populations or in low populations. The biggest contributing factor is an elongated egg laying period in the fall. So we get conditions that are conducive, so warmer temperatures or uh, a later time until we get our first frosts and freezes in October, that just lengthens the amount of time that those grasshopper females can lay eggs in the fall. So that's the first big one. And then another big contributing factor is in the spring when the eggs are hatching. Young grasshoppers are incredibly um, susceptible to heavy raindrop impact. So really hard, heavy rains right after hatch will really knock down that grasshopper population. Also, uh, just plain damp conditions right after hatch makes them susceptible to their pathogens that naturally occur. So that's one way we can decrease uh, those populations is with that moisture that's going on. In terms of what's going on in your yard, uh, if you had high populations last fall, uh, you wanna be scouting this spring during that late May and into June timeframe when those eggs are gonna be hatching. Those eggs um, will produce tiny little grasshoppers. The best thing about grasshoppers is you're not trying to find something drastically different from what the adult looks like. The nymphs look just like the adults, smaller. They might be slightly different colored compared to the adult form, but still, they're gonna look like a grasshopper to you. 
uh, check areas um, adjacent to unmanaged sites. Uh, so unmanaged sites where they weren't watered last year, they would have suffered from the drought, those grasshoppers would have moved into uh, watered lawns, gardens, those types of areas are where you're going to want to scout for those little grasshoppers uh, when they start hatching. And the importance of scouting now is they're really easy to control when they're small uh, compared to when they are adults or those late instar uh, nymphs where they're much more difficult to control or take more chemical if you're going to go the chemical route to control them. For cultural practices, uh, surprisingly one of the best things you can do is mow your yard. Uh, when you're mowing those areas, those grasshoppers do get caught by the blades, they get bagged if you're bagging. Uh, that's just a great way to knock down some of the populations um, without having to do anything extra. So if your lawn is uh, healthy and growing, that'll help you knock down those grasshoppers. Uh, also, in terms of when you are thinking about using an insecticide, uh, pay really close attention to the label, make sure you're applying it to the correct location where it's labeled for use. So if it's a garden product, make sure it's going in the garden. If it's a lawn product, make sure it's going on the lawn. Um, target those areas appropriately. Uh, best thing about small grasshoppers is they are fairly susceptible to our common homeowner products. Uh, so that those permethrins, um, pyrethrins, and those types of products will work well for those. It is so much easier to keep that grasshopper population down if you start using those tips now. Once they get past that certain stage, they are almost impossible to get rid of unless you have chickens or bricks. <laughs> All right, so Kyle, we have three on this first one. This is an O'Neill viewer, Amy. Mm -hmm. Black dots and curled leaves. This tree is uh, in the front yard. Uh, they don't know what the tree is. Lots of black specks, and then the flies love them. Uh, this is a euonymus, not a tree, technically. <clears throat> but what do you think? Yeah, um, so it's um, the black things are uh, black bean aphids. Um, and so euonymus is one of the primary hosts for, for uh, black bean aphids. Aphids have um, kind of a complicated life cycle. They have a primary host that they spend the winter on, and then in the summer they move to, uh, they migrate to herb herbaceous hosts. So um, this would be the primary overwintering host. So these would be individuals that emerge from eggs. <clears throat> so usually as the year kind of the summer goes on, those will naturally kind of go down. Um, also predators do a pretty good job of keeping aphids in control. Um, if you are, you know, if you wanna knock them back still, it's fine to just um, spray them with some soapy water or insecticidal soap. That's really effective for aphids. Um, I also see what I think might be euonymus scale on there, though, mm -hmm. and that, that would be the more concerning thing. Um, so you, euonymus scale, that can certainly cause dieback <clears throat> and um, be a really uh, big problem in, in euonymus. So that's something I would think about controlling um, really right now. Um, those crawlers should be emerging. Um, you can use some double-sided tape or something around um, infested branches, see when those crawlers are out, because that's the, the stage that we really want to target for control. It's a susceptible stage. Um, there are a lot of treatment options for the crawlers. You can use an insecticidal soap. Um, a lot of your garden um, insecticides are, are effective as well. Um, and then you can also treat with a systemic, like, um, um, a metacloprid, um, and that that can provide protection for for the full year. It won't get rid of them the systemic alone, but um, combining that with like an insecticidal soap can be really good. All right, thanks, Kyle. Two picks on this next one. We had the same issue last week, but these are back. This is Lincoln little bugs all over the flocks. So what is this? Uh, yeah, these are flocks uh, plant bugs. So um, they you <laughs> so know. Creative. They're, they're, can again cause some pretty considerable damage to flocks. They can cause um, wilting, death of, of the plant. Um, control of, of these, really one of the, the easiest things you can do is they, they overwinter as eggs in dead, uh, the dead flocks stems. So just removing those in the winter before spring um, so that they can't emerge from that, that can just be really effective at kind of keeping the population down. Um, otherwise, you can treat them with um, like a, a pyrethroid um, insecticide. Most, you know, again, kind of garden insecticides um, uh, are, are effective for, for flocks bugs. All right, uh, three picks on this one, Rock. This is a Scott's Bluff viewer and has this patch of grass in a side yard. 
He doesn't know what it is. He wants to know whether to control it and uh, will pulling and or what should he do with this? So um, I'm fairly confident, and at first I wasn't, but I showed it to a, a neighbor across the office today and he agreed with me without me prompting him, so I'm pretty confident it's brome grass. Um, we, we, it tends to be more prostrate in growth when it's been mowed or, or, or you know, do things you would normally do with a lawn. It's not a desirable for a lawn. It doesn't cut well. It is somewhat invasive. Um, seed probably blew in from the roadside or something like that. Um, but the unfortunate thing, there's nothing he can do for it because it, it, you can't selective you know, other than round up and reseed and the lawn itself around there I don't I don't know if they, that was either buffalo grass or a dead lawn so I'm not sure whether he needs to renovate completely or what he decides to do but if you see you know that's either planted within buffalo grass which would mean next fall after the second killing frost they could spray it with roundup because it'll still be actively growing but they want to eradicate that if at all possible all right, uh, one pick on this next one. Uh, this is a Benkelman viewer. What is this weed? It has a long orange taproot. Um, so it's wild four o'clock, um, but they normally have a black root, which is intriguing to me that it, she said she said orange or he said orange. Um, uh, but th you know, this is not to be confused with the hairy four o'clock, which is an actually desirable ornamental different uh, species name, Multiflorum. Um, they are can be somewhat invasive, um, so some people don't like them too much. And they get their name from the fact that they flower late afternoon. And, and they actually have a fragrance that I don't find. I actually have a four o'clock in my yard. And, um, you know, if you're standing right next to it, you can get this nice little fragrance from it. So, um, you know, maybe try to put push it back if it's really in, invading. But um, it's kind of a pleasant little plant. It's a native, so let's try to keep it propagated. All right. Uh, two pictures for you, Amy. This okay. is Brule at Lake McConaughey. Will this tree make it? They don't see any insects. They think it might be winter kill. They're on the right path here. This next yeah. picture really shows it. You can see it's all really on one side. I would assume this is the north side. This is definitely a winter kill. And at this point in time, with it affecting so much of the upper canopy, that it's not going to come back. So you might as well cut down the tree and look at replanting. <coughs> Depending on your rainfall and rule, I know you've received some rain, you might be able to go ahead and replant now. Otherwise, if we're concerned, wait until this fall um, to replant. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is a Lincoln viewer. Ponderosa pines are all showing signs of this and the tops look like they're dying. They're old trees. Is it time to spray or is it hopeless? <laughs> Well, for these, it's going to be a little hopeless. So this is brown spot, uh, or yeah, brown spot on uh, pine. This is going to affect the older needles. So this is going to be two years and older. And if you look at this picture, is really good. If you look at the top needle, you got that brown with the white on it, and then you keep going up to your right-hand side, and you got that brown and that really dark black spot. That's actually the fruiting structure of that. This is very common in older trees. It starts on the lower canopy and then it keeps working its way up. Um, you can spray it, but it is so difficult to spray those older pines because you need to drip all the way top to bottom. And so trying to spray a 50 foot pine tree or larger is pretty much impossible um, unless you want to spend a lot of money. So one thing you can do um, as those branches start to die, pruning them back, removing that dead tissue is probably the best option you can have. It is a slow progressing disease. If we continue in the drought that you are right now in this Lincoln area, the disease isn't going to progress very fast. Then we get years that it's wet, we'll see it a little bit more. At this point in time, I really wouldn't do too much. All right. Thanks, Amy. Um, all right, John, one okay, picture. I, sorry, I, I, can I inter I just want to interject yeah. on my, not on that one, but on my brome answer earlier, I don't think I mentioned that it's smooth brome, which is a perennial and not cheatgrass or downy brome, which is a winter annual. So if I forgot to do that, sorry, but I don't want people to think we were talking about the same grass. All right. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, John. Okay, John, uh, winter kill on this spirea. She wants to know if she can trim it to the base now. And this is a Syracuse viewer. Yeah, I would go ahead and just trim that down to the base and let it regrow and see what happens. All right, and uh, one picture on this one. This is Lincoln. Last year, my butterfly bush was thriving. Pruned it in early fall. It looks dead. Did she kill it? Uh, possibly, but though they're kind of slow to come back. So uh, if there's dead material, prune that out and give it a little bit more time to see if it comes back. All right, and one more picture, and this is actually a Bellevue viewer who has one of the Ito uh, tree peonies. She wants to know, is there anything she can do to hold those beautiful flowers 
upright rather than down. Well, you can stand out in the garden and hold them up, or you could use some sort of proper, uh, like a, a, a bamboo pole or something to, to get them upright. There's really no, nothing else you can do. All right, thanks, John. Well, last week we got most of our garden planted and another part of our garden is our containers. Terry James says they also got planted for the season. So let's take a minute to see what's new out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're finalizing our containers. And as you know, we love to plant our containers and make them look really good. So a few tips on what we've done so you can make sure that your containers look really good is we started with brand new potty mix. We added that slow release fertilizer to make them look good. And then we did, remember, the thriller, filler, and spiller. So that big kind of wow factor doesn't necessarily have to be tall, doesn't have to be in the middle. It can be offset so you can make it kind of asymmetrical, make it fun add some of the different colors and textures to make that fill in and then make sure that you always get something that's going to go over the edge and kind of real soften those edges and the one trick is fill the container and add one more you're going to have that better homes and gardens look on your containers for this year so stop by the backyard farmer garden and check out our container and right now it is time for the lightning round are you ready john absolutely this is a Ponca Hills viewer who has all sorts of brown fuzzy things hanging on the ends of their spruce trees and is wondering what those are. Brown fuzzy things could be cones, could be new growth, could, uh, it could be, um, I don't know, go on. <laughs> <laughs> this is an Omaha viewer who wants to know, um, has a bunch of asparagus seedlings and wants to know whether the seedlings are true to the parents, are they something different? Uh, they'll be ba basically like the parents, yes. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who knows that you're supposed to thin the fruit on the fruit trees. She's wondering, is there a fruit tree eliminator other than a human being? Um, no. <laughs> okay. We have a, a viewer who has roots above the ground on a tree. Uh, a lot of roots. It's in the right of way. He's wondering, is it okay to cut them off? No, you don't want to cut roots off of a, a tree. All right, this is a Lincoln viewer who has old oaks, pin oaks probably, huge vertical cracks in those oaks and is wondering, uh, is that, what's going on there? Why is that happening? You know, it could be a number of different reasons. I would monitor it. You might want to be ready to remove those trees. All right, nice job. All right, Amy, it's a really light path, okay. so I'm going to talk real slow. <laughs> or you can let me talk a long time. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is from a, uh, a York viewer, and uh, they have fungus in their fescue that appears in August, and they're wondering whether they should alter the pH to now to be able to fix that fungus. No, you don't want to alter it. A lot of it depends on which one it is in fescue. A lot of times it ends up being a nitrogen management issue. At sometimes we are nitrogen too heavy in the spring. We need to make sure we're doing it in the fall, and the other one is adjusting your sprinklers. Um, so we're allowing that dew to come off. All right, uh, this is a Seward viewer who has a summer fungus and is in the turf and is wondering if that should be treated with fungicides. Uh, summer spots, it, you mean we could be looking at summer patch, which is a root disease. There are some fungicides available, but in best with those, if we're looking at a summer patch, is actually overseeding and putting in resistant varieties that are going to handle it a lot better. All right, uh, this is an Omaha viewer who said their magnolia view, uh, bloomed beautifully and now it is wilting. What's going on with that? Who, depending on where it was in the state, did it get a frost? Omaha. Um, Omaha, so we potentially could add some frost injury. You're also looking at drought issues also, so give that magnolia some water. Nice job, you actually get to win because <laughs> you didn't have very many. <laughs> Woohoo, I get to win for being long-winded. <laughs> All right, are you ready, Rock? <laughs> sure. <laughs> this is an Omaha viewer who is wondering, is there a dog safe way to eliminate bindweed? A dog safe way to eliminate bindweed? Well, if they can keep the dog off of it for 24 hours, hours after spraying, then certainly I would use Quincolac or Drive. All right. Um, this is a, a viewer who is wondering, since it's so dry in so many parts of the state right now, 
Is aeration now going to help with that? Is, is there any reason to do that now? Certainly now would be a good time. Spring or fall is fine, but they can open up the turf and it can take water better if we do finally get some rainfall. So you want to irrigate before you do it so the time goes in deep enough and fire away. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who said reed canary grass is encroaching into his Kentucky uh, bluegrass fescue lawn. Is there a control? It shouldn't tolerate mowing. All right. This is a Decatur viewer who wonders about using weed and feed around brand new trees. I would not do that. This is a La Vista viewer who wants to know uh, whether they can use either Roundup or the Glove of Death on weeds and asparagus after you harvest it. Um, yeah, that would be fine. Okay, nice job. All right, insects for you, Kyle. Okay. All right, the first one here is, uh, let's see, this comes to us from a Lincoln viewer. They have uh, apparently huge ants uh, that are, or not huge ants, but they're making huge nests along the sidewalk and they think they're killing the grass. Are these field ants? Um, <clears throat> it, it's hard to say. Along the sidewalk, I would not think they're field ants. If it's like in the grass and it has a real large mound, it, it certainly could be field ants, yeah. Okay, and their follow-up question, of course, is how do they kill them? Well, that's, yeah, if it's field ants, that is, um, that is kind of tricky. I think um, there are some um, baits that, that you can use in that that have an insecticide uh, with them. Otherwise, um, you can kind of poke big holes down um, and then use an insecticide to try to get it down inside of that, but um, success with that, I think, can be challenging. All right. Uh, we have a viewer in Seward who is saying, what is the deal with clover mites still? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have another viewer who is saying the, the uh, worms that you talked about, the sawfly worms. Yeah. Are, is there another generation or is one and done? No, it's one and done. So they, they'll drop from the, the ash trees and then they're going to basically just stay in the soil and pupate in a new generation next year. So, so yeah, they're not one and done. You get more next year, yeah. right? <laughs> all right, John, plants of the week. Nice plants. job all, by the way. <laughs> plants of the week. So we have two uh, this week. Uh, so we have this uh, green uh, number here. Uh, it is an ornamental sedge. It is uh, Carex springellii, uh, or Springles uh, uh, sedge. Uh, nice sort of, uh, can be wet areas. Uh, it won't spread like some of the other sedges, uh, so that's a, a nice sedge there. And then we have a penstemon, uh, and this is the, the newer cultivar. This is dark towers. You see the, the really dark foliage on there, very nice. And then these really nice sort of purpley pink flowers. Uh, they are great for pollinators. They are a favorite for many of our pollinators. Great, thanks, John. All right, uh, Kyle, first one picture here. This is a uh, Lincoln viewer almost two weeks ago had a moth and six. What is this so they can hopefully get rid of, get rid of the moth? Well, it's, it's probably um, army cutworm and they'll go away on their own. They're, they'll migrate to the Rockies and, you know, over the next few weeks and, and not be a problem. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is a white birch, doesn't have any leaves, treated it with insect control in May. Um, it, it could be bronze, um, sorry, bronze birch borer, uh, which is related to emerald ash borer, same, same genus, um, and they, they can kill um, birch. Uh, white birch is, is particularly susceptible um, with that. If, if that's what it is, you know, at that stage, it's probably a tree or trees beyond, beyond recovery. So even though they treated it, probably not gonna help at that stage. All right, and then we have a, a Sutton viewer that has a river birch only leafing out at the bottom. Is this a bronze birch borer or is this just winter in injury? Yeah, I, winter in injury um, most likely because a river birch is very um, resistant to, to bronze birch borer, not, not really a problem for it. Okay, then we have two pictures from a Lincoln viewer. Hackberry has these seeds, these blue things, but the bumps, what are the bumps? The bumps are um, a silly they're gall caused by hackberry gall psyllids, um, and so they're kind of just like these little cicadas, um, produce gall similar to, to the sample earlier, and not a problem. All right, thanks, Kyle. Three picks for you on this one, uh, Rock. This is an Omaha viewer, first-time homeowner. 
Condition of the lawn doesn't look great, big dirt patches. She wants to use natural methods. What's our real simple piece of advice for her going into the summer? The lawn needs to be completely renovated and we could answer this question. It takes 20 minutes. We don't have that kind of time, but there are some natural products available. Uh, they can check turf.unl.edu or if they send something directly to the BYF, I will respond um, personally because it's gonna take a more elaborate plan than we have time for. All right, thank you, Rock. Uh, you have one picture here. This is a viewer who wants to know whether there is a problem with thatch on this one. My answer would be wow. And so, <laughs> they, because you don't want thatch more than a half an inch and that's clearly an inch and a half, maybe more than that. So they need to get in there and vert a cut um, because it's so far gone and uh, you know, so far thatch because when you've got that kind of thatch. Anyway, bottom line is they need to get that modified or controlled. Uh, they can vert a cut, it's really rough on the lawn, but ultimately the lawn will be healthier. It'll take water better. They won't have a place for the ugly insects and diseases to hang out in that thatch layer. So let's get that thatch taken down to our recommended half an inch. All right, uh, Amy, two pictures yep. on this one. This is a Louisville, Nebraska viewer. Um, cedar apple rust and they're wondering is there a way for her to actually control and then you actually have crab apple leaves turning yellow for your next two pictures so and then you have uh, one from Lexington that is also the galls so okay so cedar apple rust on the cedars themselves there's nothing we're going to do for management wise to control that um, the trick is you're going to want to treat your crab apples and your apples and we're kind of past that window because we're at full leaf emergence now the crab apple, this was a recent picture, right? I couldn't. Mm -hmm. These are recent. I, I was really stumped on what would be causing it to yellow. Um, besides environmental conditions, there isn't any diseases really out there right now that would be causing that yellowing. So I'd be looking at probably most likely drought conditions right now and winter desiccation issues. All right, and then again, we have the, just the one I think a gall on one of them. So, and you have one more picture, I do believe, and this is moon glow pear leaves. Mm -hmm. They were sprayed with a copper dormant oil spray, little tiny dots. There's also a Harrow Delight. She did say there's not very many spots on very many leaves. I was really struggling with this picture, I'll be honest, to really determine what it is. There are some leaf spots on pear, but it seems a little early for them. Um, there is a scab. so. I would recommend a closer picture or the best thing is take a sample into your local extension office and let them take a closer look at it. Great, thanks Amy. All right, uh, two for you, John, on this first one. They're kind of the same picture. This is a papillion viewer, planted a grapevine, wondered whether it made it through the winter. She's saying the gro growing season is 20 days behind. Is that uh, a former grapevine? I think it's a former grapevine. I think it should have been leafed out by now. I'm wondering about putting it in that raised bed because the soil can actually get colder in the winter and we could have killed out the roots. So I would just put it in the ground if you replaced it. All right, uh, one picture here. This is a Gretna viewer. Seven-year-old peach tree is cracking along that one branch, that sort of horizontalish branch and wondering is that a fixable issue? Uh, not, not really, peaches don't grow well in most of Nebraska and that's usually a winter type injury, usually differential in temperatures where the sun hits it when it's cold and it cracks open and then we get diseases. So, you know, you could try to prune that whole thing out but it's, it's not, I mean, you're gonna keep having that issue with that peach tree in that location. All right, and two pictures on this next one. This is a Glenwood, Iowa viewer planted this honey crisp. It was doing, well, and then it got hit with herbicide, killed the top, it's tiny little signs of life. Uh, what do we think? Our recommendation is usually to remove it uh, because number one, it could be a goner. And even if it's not a goner, we don't know what the herbicide is or what the safety is around using those on edible crops. Uh, and so because we can't prove that, I would take that out and replace it. Great, thanks, John. Well, most Nebraskans are familiar with ticks. As we all spend a lot of time outdoors and around our gardens, it's really not uncommon to come in with a few ticks. Jody Green says one particular species, the lone star tick, carries the risk of a serious disease. Here's Jody to tell us more. We've done a couple tick videos on how to prevent tick bites in the past, but today we're gonna to talk about a specific tick called the Lone Star Tick. We have several species here in Nebraska, but one you may not be familiar with is that Lone Star Tick. The reason we want to become familiar with it is because it has the potential to cause some harm to human health. 
including the association between tick bites and the red meat allergy. The red meat allergy is also called the alpha-gal syndrome, and it is a delayed allergic reaction to red meat. And this includes when a human eats beef, pork, venison, lamb, or rabbit. And alpha-gal is also found in the saliva of the Lone Star tick. When the Lone Star Tick bites a human, that alpha-gal molecule stays in the body and after someone eats red meat, may have a mild or severe allergic reaction. And this occurs about four to six hours after the red meat is consumed. Unfortunately, there is no cure for the red meat allergy or alpha-gal syndrome, and the person who is allergic has to stop eating red meat. So let's take a look at what this tick looks like. The Lone Star Tick, as a female adult, has a white spot on its back, which is why it's called the Lone Star Tick. The male does not have this, but it looks like these golden horseshoes at its bottom end. They have very rounded bodies, so they're more like a circle than an oval compared to some of our dog ticks, and they have really long mouth parts. We also need to keep in mind that ticks have various life stages. So they can be a lot smaller and we call those larvae seed ticks, which are like pepper flakes. And they can also be a little bigger in the nymph stages, but all these stages can bite. These Lone Star ticks are commonly found in woodland areas where there's dense vegetation, very similar to some of our state parks, our backyards and some other wooded areas. These are very aggressive biters. So unlike some of our dog ticks that will crawl up our body and try to embed in our scalp, these ones will start biting as soon as they get to skin. So we're talking ankles and legs and the groin area, knee pits. So you want to be able to check yourself fully after you come in from outdoor activity. If you're looking to learn more and get a refresher about tick safety, we've got some excellent videos that we've done in the past. So go to the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel and check those out. So protect you and your family. Keep a sharp eye out for those ticks during and after any of those outdoor activities. Jody mentioned the video about avoiding ticks and you can watch it on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. There are also plenty of other great videos on several topics we talk about on the show. You can even watch hundreds of those past programs. So check it out after the show. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. We have a couple of announcements, um, I think. The first one is the annual Monroe Meyer Garden Walk, June 11th in Omaha. And uh, not much else going on right now because we're all getting ready for summer. So last round of questions. Your first one here comes from Seward, Kyle. And this they say they're just curious. Is this a ladybug or is this an Asian lady beetle? And is one better than the other? Well, it's, <clears throat> it's a... An Asian lady beetle is a ladybug, um, but an invasive one or non-native. Um, this is a native convergent um, ladybug, and yeah, it's. I guess it's it's better. So, I mean, <laughs> they're, they're both objectively okay. better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is a grand. Your second picture here is a Grand Island viewer. She says, um, seeing a few of these, and they hide in the soil, sort of, and then they come up and they slowly walk. They don't really run away. Are these good guys or bad guys? Yeah, it's good. It's, it, um, this is a woodlouse uh, hunter, so this is a, a spider that specializes on, like, roly-polies and pill bugs. Um, they'll, they'll eat other things, but that's what they, they really like. All right. Uh, this is a carny viewer who is uh, actually saying in, in his lifespan, and he's, you know, he's fished for a long time, Asking, what happened to the night crawlers? The sidewalks used to be covered with them, and now it just seems like there aren't any night crawlers around. Well, I really don't know, but I, I would say that's probably a good thing because night crawlers are also non-natives. They're um, actually from Europe and, um, and can have some pretty detrimental effects on, on soil health. So it's probably good that they're not as common, but I don't know what's happened to them. All right, and I believe we have no more pictures for you, if I'm not mistaken, and three for you, Rock. So uh, this is a viewer from Lincoln who is saying, what might be causing these dead spots in my lawn? The rest of it looks good. 
Yeah, I'm going to say that's probably some winter kill or carryover from drought injury. A lot of the lawns have thinned out a lot, so and that's where something's been digging around and eating roots and maybe some grubs. But it's not grubs causing that. There's no pathogens that are really going to be that active this time of year. So I'm going to say that uh, probably needs to be reseeded and make sure you keep water on it, et cetera. And that right round hole is a critter. Yeah, probably. some kind. Okay. All right. Uh, you have one picture on this next one. This is a Millard viewer. She's wondering, is this a plant or a weed? And she's thinking black snake root. Yeah, I don't think this is black snake root, but I, I can't tell her it's not because I'm not sure what this is. I really need to see a, a flower or a closer picture of it. So I'm going to say pass on this one, unfortunately. All right. And send us a picture. And send us a picture, especially when it starts to flower. All right, uh, and one more picture for you, and this is an Omaha viewer. This comes up in the garden every spring. Every year there are more of them, and this year they've encroached into the lawn. She always tries to pull it up, which is easier said than done. She does want to know how to get rid of it, and she doesn't want to use chemicals. Yeah, and this is one, I can't even remember the name of it, but it's, some people call it palm grass. It's not palm grass because palm grass is a tropical, but at the end of the day, it gets a big white leaf on it and big fat rhizomes that are just impossible to pull up. There's going to have to be an aggressive herbicide program with something like glyphosate to get rid of that. Um, if it gets a seed head on it, take another picture and we can positively ID it. All right, or I can bring it in from my yard. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, you have two pictures on uh -huh. this one. Uh, this <clears throat> comes to us from East Lincoln, wondering about this strange light green color on this astilbe. It's the second year. It's also three weeks later than the other ones in the shade garden. It's a little late. I didn't catch that part earlier. We might be dealing with a virus, so I would really consider replacing this astelbe since it's so farther behind and with the symptomology that it's showing. Yeah, that, that's not At good. first I was going nutrient, but since it's so delayed, I'm going to lean toward probably viral. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is a Waterloo, Nebraska viewer. Just purchased and planted these hostas from an Omaha nursery within the last two weeks. Uh, they started showing these whitish yellow spots where it appears that the leaves are dying, the plants are in the ground surrounding a plug. What's causing this? To me, this looks like mm. sun scald. So either it happened when it was in the nursery when we had some of those really hot days and you watered from above, or even after you planted it, we hit some hot days there. And if you had any water on top, it just caused a sun scald. It's not going to hurt your hosta. All right, and one picture, and she's wondering what caused the damage to the indoor plant. She did say that she used bottled water, so the salts are not an oh, the issue. salts are not an issue. <laughs> oh, I, I know you were going that direction. Yeah, I was going to go that direction. <laughs> Houseplants are so difficult. They're from Omaha. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to suggest go talk to John, bring the sample into him, and let him take a little bit closer look because I know he likes houseplants. And I'll hand it off to Scott. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. You have uh, two pictures on this first one, uh, John, and this is a Blair viewer. Asparagus bed with Mary Washington. Fifth year he's planted it. Uh, this spring has an asparagus stalk they've never seen before. And they, they, she's not going to harvest this. What is this and, and <laughs> what's going on? Right. It's really fun. I love this. So it's a, a type of a phenomenon called fasciation. And so basically it's uh, a bunch of th uh, stems all together or flattening out of a stem. There's lots of different causes for it. It could just be physical damage, it could be insect feeding, it could be viral. You know, I would just pop it off uh, and if it keeps coming back, maybe replace that plant. Otherwise, it just, it just happens. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. They grow various hot peppers and different bells. The hot ones all produce a lot of fruit and the bells don't. They try to rotate. What's up with that? Some peppers produce a lot of fruits and some peppers don't. <laughs> uh, really, it's probably a, a, a cultivar thing, a genetic thing. Uh, so some peppers are very productive and, and some not so much. So, you know, if you're looking for bells, you know, try around from different cultivars to see. Uh, we also have, just like we have tomatoes, we have like determinate and indeterminate where some keep producing and come, some stop producing or produce all at once. Peppers can have the same thing. So I would just shop around and look for different cultivars uh, to test them out. It's not anything going wrong. It's just how peppers are. All right, and two pictures on this uh, last one, and this is a, a rhizome growing wild plant in an Omaha garden, 10 inches tall, 
lined leaves not planted intentionally. This is a fun one. Right, this one is a fun one. So this is a, a wild plant uh, called green dragon and it's related to arums. Uh, so it's a, an aeroid type plant. You get those uh, spaths that are up on the top. So those will actually produce berries that feed a lot of wildlife, uh, but they're really fun. They're actually kind of a, what we would call like a semi-rare type of wild plant. So enjoy or bring me some, I'm fine. <laughs> All right, or come see ours in the courtyard on East yeah. Campus.